really this morning is a bit of a teaser message, if you like, like a teaser trailer for the rest of the year, because we really feel God has given us, I know that God has given us a road ahead to follow. Um, We did gather together as a leadership team during the week, and I just want to say thanks to everybody who was praying towards that. I think these are really significant things to seek God for whatever his fresh vision is um, for each season. And the funny thing is, I remember going back to the beginning of last year, having conversations with um, people like people like Rob about the possibility of, of pastoring. And what's Matt, what's your vision for the church? And for the most part, my vision for the church is to continue what was started by Jesus and the apostles. I don't have some unique vision. I don't have like a Matt-shaped vision for the church of Jesus. <laughs> I want to find and follow his plan. But that also means following where the Spirit leads, because in the age of the apostles, they did that too. So on the one hand, we've got this kind of, we just need to go back. We've got this situation where we need to go back and pick up the mission that was, that was started in the New Testament and just keep going. We don't need some brand new thing. But then on the other hand, we do need the voice of the Spirit. We always need some new thing. So we've got these two kind of these two things in tension all the time. And when we got together on Thursday night and, uh, and, and spoke about the road ahead, I already had plenty sort of planned. I was primed and ready to talk about what was on my heart after some time in prayer uh, over the new year. And the team had lots of other thoughts too, and we added that all together. And I think we've got a really special year ahead. So today will be a little bit different. It's not a big biblical preach, which is sort of my bread and butter. But we're going to share where we're at and where we're going, uh, and that's also really important. And I will share some scripture at the end that really speaks into where we're going as a church. So practically, I'll just talk about some practical things that we landed on uh, together as a team. First, we'll get the kind of boring stuff out of the way first. Um, Coming out of the time of isolation that we've come out of, all the ups and downs and lockdowns and everything else, We need to get together more. (laughs) This is a unanimous feeling uh, among everybody that I've spoken to is we've learnt the value of community. We've learnt the value of real time and space. We've really missed that. And um, we just need to do more stuff together because it's been a quiet, tentative, sort of conservative time. Everybody's like, what's going on? What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? And that's all right. That's just the situation that we've been in. But we need to go beyond a tentative, quiet Sunday service and that's it, if you know what I mean. Um, Just doing anything together other than the norm can be a really beautiful thing. Our little brunch at Beachside at the start of the year, how good was that? Everybody loved that. Just getting together as a community, enjoying time, a fellowship together um, and doing like just enjoying life together. So things like worship nights, bring them on. Things like this are coming back. Things like having dinner or lunch lunch together on the weekends, when that works for everybody practically, we'll just throw the invite out and whoever can come can come. Things like this that just connect us together and help us to come back to life a little bit as a community. These things are coming. We've spoken about a church camp. Um, I haven't done one of those in a long time, but we'll see how that idea develops. Even just fun little stuff like trivia nights and board game nights and stuff like that are really worth doing. Because we're a family, right? So we want to come back to life as a family together. And uh, that's something we're, I think we're all probably very much agreed on. Later in the year, we'll also talk about some more missional things that we want to do in the world together. Because that's part of being the New Testament church, is actually doing missional stuff as the people of God. So that's going to unfold a little bit as the year goes on. Part of doing this and opening up to one another in real time and space again, is to really prioritise this, being together in person. And it was actually, again, a unanimous decision of the leadership team that this means that for now, we're we're actually going to put Zoom to sleep on Sunday. That has done its job, and it's been great, but it actually had a particular job to do. It was designed to get us through COVID, and it did really, really help with that. But we want to be together in real time and space, worshipping. Um, so we're just going to let that be the end of Zoom for now. This is actually the last week on Zoom. 
Um, and, and we do have options. So it's not like we're saying nobody can get anything in terms of sermons or anything else, because we do do that. So a lot of the time, um, sermons will be available on video on our YouTube page. When we don't do video, which can happen for lots of different reasons, but we do it about half of the time, we do a video message. And the rest of the time, we keep it as an audio message in our Facebook group for the church, which lots of you are in. It's, I don't love having that trapped in Facebook because not everybody's on Facebook. I don't want to be on Facebook. I'm kind of leaving Facebook at the moment. So I don't want that to just li live only on Facebook and we're looking at that, making it all available through the website or something like that. So you're not stranded. If you have been using Zoom, um, you'll still be able to keep up. And all the other stuff that we do anyway, like connecting with live worship over Zoom is pretty hard, let's be honest. So Zoom isn't really brilliant for that. And it's obviously not brilliant for joining in with the meeting and greeting and stuff either. So I don't think there's really a great loss letting that one go. Um, another little practical thing you might have noticed this morning. Um, we're going to stop with our late start times. Um, I'll, I'll admit that that was partly my fault because sometimes I don't know how to wind up a conversation and be ready for 10 a.m. So that's on me. Uh, but that has gotten pretty sloppy. And, uh, and we're going to go for very sharp, well, as sharp as we can, 10 a.m. starts, just to be respectful of everybody. Everybody's time matters. Um, and it also, of course, it just pushes the finish time back. And we've all got to get back to doing other things later in the afternoon. So that's just some practical stuff. And um, when it comes to the events that we're talking about and just opening up different things into the life of the church, that's all going to slowly come out through the early stages of the year. Now, the good stuff. Spiritually, where are we going? What's the road ahead for us? Well, like I said before, the road map of the New Testament church, for the most part, is pretty clear. And for the most part, we find what Jesus and the apostles started and we keep it going. But there's always a fresh wind of the Spirit as well. So I'm going to be talking today about holding those two things together and following where God is leading us at the moment. In terms of our sort of themes and preaching and topics and stuff like that, I already had a really clear picture of what's ahead and none of that has changed. I felt God reaffirmed that at the start of this year. So that's, but I don't want to talk about all of that because it just spoils everything. Nobody likes spoilers. So I'm just going to let that trickle out as the year goes on. Um, but there's one big thing that I want to talk about today and that is welcoming the Holy Spirit into our midst. Dad's preach last weekend was great. I think everybody here would say that he really touched on something. Um, and there's a reason I asked him to, to share on the Holy Spirit. I feel, and again, the whole leadership team feels that this is a very new time and God wants to do something new and that we need to have some new level of openness to new and unfamiliar things. Not scary things, not unsafe things, things of God, things of the Holy Spirit. And we need to open up our time for the Holy Spirit. We need to open up the forms of our worship for the Holy Spirit to move in different ways. And we just need to give him space. One of the things that probably lots of us have seen across lots of different ways of doing church is that we kind of program everything in very particularly and that can be helpful, just having a plan. Nothing wrong with having a plan. But sometimes I look at these programs and it's like almost every 15-second block is tightly accounted for. And I've got to say that for myself, I'm just like, when does God get to speak into that program? You know, God can work within plans, but we're really giving him a pretty tough job sometimes <laughs> by programming everything down to very particular things that we do in very particular amounts of time. So we need to open up a little bit, and we've had a little bit of an experience of that today. We just spent like an hour just in worship and communion, and this is the stuff of Christian life. We don't have to rush this stuff. So welcoming the Spirit. Welcoming the Spirit does mean making space for the spiritual gifts. It means teaching on the spiritual gifts, sharing the spiritual gifts, it means a fresh focus on our music and our worship, more space for music and for the arts on Sunday, and for hopefully creative ideas for things through the year 
that we can just express in beautiful new ways. We've got a wonderful dance team and a dance school connected to the church. Let's find ways to bring the arts alive and make things like Christmas and Easter. And I'm sure this church has done things like this in the past, but let's make these glorious, creative expressions of our love for Jesus. Priscilla and I, in some way, are going to get a little bit more involved with music, but not looking to sort of take over or anything like that. Um, I've just been helping out, filling in over the last couple of weeks, and we'll be helping out in a few different ways as well um, from now on. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, But here's the thing. What I don't mean is that I'm about to start a sermon series on the Holy Spirit. And that sermon series will have a beginning and a middle and an end. And then we're like, thanks, Holy Spirit. That's nice. I just learned lots of things about you. I don't want to do Holy Spirit Week. I don't want to have a Holy Spirit month. This is actually about inviting the Spirit into the very culture and the very environment of our church and allowing Him to speak into everything. And actually, the sermon series that I'm starting next week, on the face of it, when I start, it won't be anything to do with the Holy Spirit when we kick it off. And you'll be like, well, what's all this Holy Spirit talk about? But trust me. We're going to be letting the Spirit speak in all things. And we really feel that this is the time for that to happen. The Holy Spirit isn't an optional extra. Sometimes, you know, we talk about the Trinity. We've got Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Father and Son get 99% of the airtime a lot of the time. Am I right? The Holy Spirit is kind of like the forgotten God sometimes. And we are not going to forget It doesn't mean everything will be Holy Spirit all the time. But we are not going to forget the third person of the Trinity in our church. Does that sound like a good idea? I think that's a good idea. And I'd have to say, I don't think we can really worship in the full New Testament sense. I don't even think we can even preach the gospel in the full New Testament sense without worshipping in spirit without preaching the gospel in spirit. This is the language of the New Testament. This is the language of Paul. For the church to be dripping in spiritual life. That's my dream. That's what I want to see. So in the end, speaking about the road ahead, we've got some practical things that we want to do differently. Um, to come back to life as a church and then in the spiritual dimension, if you like, we are welcoming the Spirit. This is the road ahead for us, making more space for the spiritual gifts, like I said, for ministry time, making more space for music and worship. Um, Dad did a great job last week of helping us to think a little bit more flexibly about the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes we just think of it in categories. It's like, oh, no, this is going to go all charismatic now. Some of us might have thought that. I didn't think that because I'm fine with that. Some of us might have thought, oh, boy, this is going to go all Pentecostal. But these are just words. They're just labels. And sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they're not. All we're doing is making space for the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit speak. And part of that actually rests on me. I think we all know that when the Holy Spirit becomes a big part of the life of a church, stuff can get weird sometimes. Again, am I right? Yeah? And sometimes that's an amen, and sometimes that's a not so sure about that thing that just happened, right? So when we open up to the Holy Spirit, stuff can get weird. And some of it is good, and some of it sometimes is not. So actually, by, by doing this, by saying this about the road ahead, I'm taking quite a bit of responsibility on myself and on our leadership team to lead this well. I'll speak a little bit about that um, as we go through the scripture today, but it does need to be led well. I do understand the benefits and the risks of letting the Holy Spirit blow a fresh wind through the church because I grew up in a Pentecostal church and we grew up surrounded by other Pentecostal churches and we've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. So just relax. I'm not going to start some crazy new movement or something like that. This is just the culture of the New Testament church. 
So today I want to look at two short passages and, and what they mean for us right now to speak into this. And they're probably going to be very surprising passages because they don't sound very Holy Spirity at the beginning. But a couple of weeks ago, Nasi took us through the book of 2 Thessalonians, a great little kind of fast-tracked bird's eye view of that book. And he identified like a key passage in that book, and I think he was right. And the key passage that he saw in, in 2 Thessalonians was this. Let's just bring it up. Verse 15 of chapter 2. Therefore, brethren, I'm reading New King James, I love the New King James. Stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Okay, that doesn't sound like a very exciting verse and it definitely doesn't sound very Holy Spirity when we first pass it by. Actually, it's the kind of thing that a lot of Protestants and Pentecostals and generally non-traditional Christians might just brush on past and keep reading and look, looking for the good stuff. But this is a really important verse. Nasi's version that he was reading from said, Stand firm and hold fast. Great wording. Stand firm and hold fast. But stand firm on what? Hold fast to what? And we might see the word tradition and say, okay, this is just about not losing our way or something like that. And we might even think that this means don't let anything new happen. Stand firm on the traditions that I've given you. Stand firm on those, uh, hold fast to those traditions that I've given you. Let's just dive into this for a couple of minutes and see how much gold there is sitting in this little passage. If we bring up the next slide just to highlight a couple of words in there. Again, they don't look very spectacular. Stand on those things which were taught to you, whether by word or by our epistle. Okay, now what's an epistle? We all know that, I think. It's a letter, right? So, what does he mean by stand firm or hold on to the letter which was given to you by us? It's not a trick question. What book are we in at the moment? Second Thessalonians. So, if he's talking about a letter that he wrote, past tense, what might he be talking about? First Thessalonians, all right. Stand firm on the stuff that I said in that letter that I wrote you in First Thessalonians. Now, that little letter, <laughs> in time, became Scripture for the rest of us. So let's not miss what's going on here. This is a church leader who is so in tune with the voice of the Spirit, so dripping with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he can write a letter to his mates in Thessalonica, encouraging them in what God is calling them to do and be, and it becomes scripture for the rest of us. That's pretty amazing. So for us now, looking back on that scripture called First Thessalonians, known to Paul as that letter that I wrote you guys a while ago, for us, it's not that surprising that he would say, stand firm on that, because we see that as scripture. But what about the other word that's underlined here? The word word. What's he talking about? What could that mean? Yeah, I've got some of these going on. Yes. Again, this is not a trick question. And let's not miss the power of this. He's actually saying to the New Testament church, stand on those things that I verbally told you while I was with you in the room. And he's categorised that, this is in the same category, as the letter that he wrote them which became scripture for us. Stand firm on both of these things. My goodness. So here we've got someone who is so sure and so inspired in their gifting that not only the letter that he wrote became scripture, 
But even the words that came out of his mouth in real time, in a building or in some gathering, just like what we're having now, that that would be binding and he would say, stand on those words because God gave me those words and he has called me to be an apostle. Such confidence. But in Paul, we get this incredible combination of confidence in the Holy Spirit and a knowledge of his gifting as the apostle to the Gentiles but also great humility because he called himself the chief of all, what? All sinners. Great confidence in God, great humility in himself. This is what we need if we want the Holy Spirit to move among us and if we want to not mess that up. We need to be sure of God's gifting but humble in and of ourselves. A few questions connecting this back to today. So we've just learned that it's possible for a person who knows and sees their gifting fully to not just write inspired stuff, but even say inspired stuff. That's possible. It happened. New Testament. Past tense is what we're talking about right now. Let's talk about now. Here are some questions, right? A few questions connecting this to today. Am I the Apostle Paul? Rhetorical question. Only one right answer. Factually, no, I am not. Do I get to just say and assume that all the things that were true for him are true for me? No, I don't think I do get to do that. Do I have exactly the same calling and gift as Paul? No, I don't get to say that either. Does anybody really get to just call themselves an apostle and have an apostolic ministry and run around telling everybody what God wants everybody to do? I don't think that's the spirit of this at all. And I don't think that's true. But here are some more questions. Isn't the same spirit that lived in Paul and lived in the first century, that was actually the same spirit that lived in Jesus, isn't that same spirit living in you and in me, in all of us? Could you be, in a different sense, called to some apostolic ministry? It's absolutely possible that you are. These were the original apostles and they get the special status of apostle, if you like, with capital A. These are the apostles of the, of the early church. But the apostle, apostolic ministry is still alive and well. I know because I've seen it. I've seen it in action around the world. And the power of that, when somebody knows their calling. And I have to say, I am very proud to be the son of my dad because he's shown me what it means to know your gifting. It doesn't mean you're perfect. And actually, the great thing is when you've got great gifting alongside great humility. And that's something I'm going to keep highlighting because really things can go off the rails when we have one and not the other. More questions? Dad spoke last week about the unfinished act in the book of Acts, if you like. Maybe chapter 29 of Acts, which hasn't been written yet. Aren't we living in the continuation of those first days of the New Testament? Aren't we still waiting for Jesus to return? But we've been given the Holy Spirit. We are post-Pentecost, but before the return of Jesus. And are there not lots of gifts, more than just apostle like we see in Paul? There are some that are public, right? And we think of them as being the really obvious ones like prophecy and great apostles and stuff like that. That's the stuff that makes us go, wow. But there are lots of gifts and they're all incredibly valuable. And they are hidden treasures in this very room right now. When I look around, I see the same potential in us that lived in the early church. We are made of the same stuff. We have the same spirit living inside us. We follow the same Lord. We actually live in the same age. It's been a really long age. It's been 2,000 years. But we're still living in this age. Might the spirit be calling us to believe again that signs and wonders can still happen on the earth and will still draw people to Jesus the way that they did in the New Testament age? It's time for us to open up to the Spirit again. We need Him. 
Let's just look back at one more thing uh, before we talk about what this means for us now. If Paul, in this passage in 2 Thessalonians, if he is referring back to his first letter and he's saying, hold to these traditions or to this tradition, what's, what's he actually asking them to stand firm on? Well, let's look right now at some of the stuff that we get in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And it's not some dry tradition or dead tradition. Um, and there are a million other verses we could look at in Paul to say, you know, this is what Paul believes about spiritual life in the church. But let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. So this is the stuff that Paul was referring back to and saying, stand firm on this stuff. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. And yet he says, test all things and hold fast to what is good. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Don't keep the gifts of God hidden away or in a box. Let them breathe. Let them live. But do it with wisdom. Do it with discernment. This <laughs> is part of the tradition that Paul is calling them to stick to. This is actually the life of the church. So when he's using the word tradition, we need to change our thinking around that word tradition because in the Bible it means something different. And actually, in the traditional word, they mean something different to what we mean too. Unfortunately, we can get a little bit sort of tribal in our thinking and we can think all tradition is, is bad. And I understand that language because some of us are actually here because we're trying to get away from dead tradition. Is that, is that right? I know that that's true. But we're not talking about tradition in that sense. Stand firm on this tradition. It's a living tradition. It's an ongoing culture to hold to, a dynamic spiritual life, including these things that Paul's always encouraging around the gifts, including prophecy, even tongues and all the rest that he talks about through his letters. Don't depart from that. Wow. Wow. Don't depart from that stuff. That life of the Spirit is actually part of what is solid and trustworthy and true. I think uh, this living tradition, this dynamic thing that's been passed down through the ministry of Jesus and the apostles, this word kind of messes with our heads a little bit when we use it in this way, the word tradition. But actually... We forget that the church at its best, even when it's full of spiritual life, is holding on to beautiful, God-given, sacred things. And they are the living tradition of the church of God, dripping in the life of the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed that we do certain things at certain times and the Holy Spirit seems to breathe on them and move on them? When people become believers, we don't, give them like a scavenger hunt to go on or tell them to run across the road blindfolded or something like that. We have a ritual for them, if you like, a tradition for them when they are entering into new life in Christ, they get baptised. And that's a beautiful spirit-led and spirit-inhabited tradition where God does work in them and it marks a new time in their life, putting to death the old man and bringing to life the new. Good tradition is good. <laughs> bad tradition is bad. Kind of makes sense. When we get together on Sunday, we don't sort of just play video games and watch the cricket to remember Jesus. That would be a bit strange. And we don't even do some of the things that worship is used to do. We don't sacrifice animals on the altar anymore, which I'm grateful for. We worship in prayers and in song. We share the scriptures together. 
We take communion together. This is the stuff that's been going on for 2,000 years. So there's a very big difference between dead tradition or traditionalism and the living tradition that caught hold in the first century. And that's actually the anchor for us. If we're to live in spirit and see the spirit move without losing our way, this is where we're anchored. And the incredible thing is I'm talking again. It's hard to get out of this thinking where you've got the safe stuff and then you've got the spirit. But actually Paul includes the spirit in that safe stuff, that tradition that we must hold to. So we're thinking about the old and the new and how to hold them together. And if we're going to go big on the life of the Spirit in this church, we need to be firmly rooted in the Scriptures. We need to be firmly rooted even, I would say, in historical Christianity, in the basic affirmations and even the creeds of historical Christianity have to be so strong. They help us to anchor ourselves. And why am I so focused on being grounded like this? I think too many charismatic movements and Pentecostal movements have ended badly because they lose their simple, humble grounding. They forget where they've come from. They forget where their anchors are. Suddenly they become the centre of their own universe and God is doing something through us and through me and I am the gifted one. And it all becomes very self-concerned. And one thing that I believe is that God gives grace to the humble. And he resists the proud. He resists the proud. We've got to run from that really fast. Ego can destroy a move of the Holy Spirit. So I am going to return ad nauseum to humility as a theme in all things. Because the life of the Spirit can only continue if humility continues. All the good stuff comes from him anyway. (laughs) Sometimes churches losing their way on this stuff. It's not just about me and us and our movement and our brand even. Good Lord, that becomes a thing. Promoting our brand and having the biggest brand in the church world or something like that. We've got to run far away from this stuff. But as well as running away from the me culture, we've got to not just obsess about the new thing all the time. Christianity has always been about the old and the new. We're grounded in things which have always been true. We're grounded in things that were revealed by Jesus only 2,000 years ago, but do not change. And if we're anchored on those things we can safely let the Spirit of God sort of blow us around without ever losing our way. That sounds good, doesn't it? A church dripping with the life of the Spirit that never loses her way. If only we'd seen that more in the world around us. If I had to point the the finger, this might be a little unfair, but I'm just going to do it anyway. If I had to point the finger on why this spirit-led culture has strayed a little bit. I have to kind of point across the pond at America a little bit. I'm sorry. American culture doesn't mix very well with Christian culture. And the popular culture that we inherit, even in Pentecostal and charismatic circles, unfortunately has a lot of American baggage, American cultural baggage. And what is American culture all about? It's all about me. (laughs) And it's not all bad. I'm not saying America is the worst thing in the world or anything like that necessarily. Um, But I want to look around at what God's doing in very different cultures. Because I've learned more from poor pastors in the Philippines than I have from anybody on YouTube or early morning TV. I've learned more from being in the Mediterranean and being where the least and the lowly are their dependence and their faith, it's just off the charts because it's not about them. It can't be about them. In their mind, they're nobodies and they desperately need their God. So I learned from them. I think that's a much better well to be drawing from. Dad mentioned last week 
a trip to the Philippines which we went on, which was just a beloved trip. It's, it's a memory that's burned into my spirit and my mind. And on this trip, it, there was just a special grace for healing on this trip. It was like everywhere we went, miracles just happened, broke out. And even little old me, right, I don't, I don't call myself someone with a, a special healing gift. I wouldn't give myself like the office of healer or something like that. We should be very slow to do that, actually. But on this trip, it was just like God wanted to use me. And I had this revelation in my mind of how Jesus is king. And nobody gets to mess with Jesus as king. Nobody gets to touch his royal identity. And when the enemy comes against these precious souls in the Philippines and binds them up with sickness and disease. I just couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. So when I prayed for them, I was, I was just aflame with this faith. And their faith was at 11 out of 10 all the time. Because they're just like, well, I love my God and I trust him. And if he wants to heal me, he will. And I think he can. And it was that simple. And I remember praying for a lady in a little church, middle of nowhere, I couldn't even piece together where we were because you just get on a jeepney and you go to this thing and you get on another jeepney and you go to the next thing. i got no idea where I was. I'd have to do some serious detective work to, to work that out. But this little lady comes up to me for prayer afterwards and I don't have any special powers. I'm just another follower of Jesus who trusts that he wants to do good things in the world. And she came up and asked me to pray for her. And this is... In a prayer line, this is everybody's worst nightmare because she had three physical ailments and she wanted prayer for all of them. And it was a glaucoma in her eye, something called a goiter in her neck, which I don't really know what that is, but it's apparently pretty painful and has, gives pressure and pain. And then she had a, a long-term injury in her hip. She's like, can you pray for all of that, Pastor? I'm like, sure, <laughs> sure, I can pray for the, I can pray for all of that. But I just I set my own insufficiency aside and brought her before the Father, put Jesus in the highest place, spoke his name as king over where she was at in her situation and just humbly declared the, the kingship of Jesus over her. And then I asked her, are you doing okay? Are you feeling anything? And she's just sort of dazed and confused. She said, I, my pain is gone, Pastor. I'm like, what? I said, yeah, and I, I can see the glaucoma eye was perfectly healed. Externally, I could see that it was normal. And for, from her point of view as well, she could see perfectly, equally out of both eyes. She hadn't seen like that since she was young. Not me, no power in me. All him, all by the work of the Spirit. And she said, the goiter in my neck. The pain is gone. Okay, <laughs> what about the pain in your hip? That's completely gone too, Pastor. I'm like, okay, wow. Thank you, Lord. I was dazed and confused as well. Thank you, Lord. This seems like a true miracle. But I've got to admit, I went home and I'm like, Did, was that just like hype or adrenaline or something? So I, I doubt myself sometimes, okay, that happens. And I thought, I'm going to check in again in two months because it just felt like a good amount of time. And I'm going to call Pastor Mila in, in the Philippines and just ask her about this lady and whether or not she's still healed, as the man of great faith that I am. Is she still okay? You know, have these things really gone for good? And you know what she said? She was so confused. She was just like, of course, Pastor. <laughs> of course. Of course she's still healed. And I was, of course, utterly flawed. And it pulled me up on my own <laughs> lack of faith that I can have sometimes. And we need to be a little bit more simple in our disposition towards God when it comes to things like this. And to just see him as the good father and trust him for his gifts. We've always got questions. Why do these things happen sometimes and not other times? And these are really difficult questions sometimes. But if we let those questions cheat us out of being the simple children who bring our needs to God, then we're never in that place of opportunity. That woman only got healed in her situation because she positioned herself 
in faith. And she did it humbly. She wasn't demanding God to heal her. And I'm sure if it had gone differently, she wouldn't have gone home and hated herself or or hated God because she wasn't healed. It was just a wonderful mystery and a wonderful gift that he healed her. We have to focus on those wonderful gifts when they arrive. And I would say even grow in our expectation that they're going to come more often because we must be positioned for them in some way. Even Jesus struggled to heal where there was no faith. Faith is not the whole picture, but it's an indispensable part of the picture for us to bring our faith. But the great enemy of a new move in this church, a new move of the spirit in this church, will be the ego of the gifted people. I know that's a weird thing to say. I want to get us excited about the Holy Spirit, but I don't want it to all come crashing down because Pastor Matt's full of himself or because the person on stage with the great gift of worship is full of themselves. And it can and will happen if we don't bring ourselves humbly before God and say, Lord, use us in whatever glorious way that you want. So a spiritually alive church where we are anchored in the truths that never change, the timeless truth of Scripture, the words of Jesus, the words of the New Testament and the whole Bible, but open, open to a fresh wind. And when we're anchored, like I said before, we can let the Spirit blow us around in all the wonderful ways that I know that he will without ever losing our way. Can we believe for that? Can we trust God for that? Thank you, Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we just want to be your children. We want to be children living fully in the kingdom of God. We want to be children of the good Father who are alive in spirit. Who know how to worship in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we invite you now, we ask you now to bring a fresh wind into this church. We know that you can. And I know that you want to. And Lord, we welcome you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We say, come and fall afresh on us. Fill us with your power. Help us to do your work in the world. Help us to not get too big for our boots when you do. Lord, forgive us for our lack of faith sometimes. You know all things. You see our hearts. You know our hurts and our histories and everything that can be behind all of that. Lord, help us to be faith-filled children of the King. Help us to look to you for all things. Even the Lord's Prayer that Steve was reading out from that message translation, Lord, we, we can't do anything without you. We need to need you. We need to need you more than we do as wealthy Western people. Help us to need you. Help us to be poor in spirit. Blessed are those, for they will see the kingdom. Help us, Lord. Lord, we pray for a new season in our worship. We pray that you help us as your humble musicians to really usher people into your presence. Help us to bring some fresh wind when we do worship. Help us to grow in our skills and our talents to bring our best to you. Help us in our preaching, in all of the things that we do, Lord. Saturate it with your Holy Spirit, but also with the truth and the strength and the solid and the strong things that will keep us straight and true. Lord, we leave all of these things in your hands and we just trust you with this new time. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen.